Alice, welcome. Hi, Max. Thanks so much for having me. It's a delight to be here talking with you. I honestly, honestly, it's a delight for me to have you here. Let's let's get into the questions. So much of the reputation that disabled people have is built by non-disabled people, and it's built around ideas of misfortune, sadness, embarrassment, burden. What have you learned about the ways that reputations, even ones that are old and stale, what have you learned about the ways that like reputations can actually sometimes begin to, to change? On reputation and reputation building specifically, so much of it is dependent on culture. Part of why I am a writer and activist is to help push the culture forward, but ableism is such an ingrained part of our society that change happens at a glacial pace and it takes a collective effort, not just me or a handful of disabled people. Until non-disabled people reflect and confront their implicit bias about disability and do the work on unlearning their ableism. Will disabled people be able to truly play a larger role in constructing their reputation? There will always be people in power who want to maintain the status quo and the ability to distort and erase disabled people's sense of self and their reputations because it serves them. I myself try not to care too much about what people think of me and continue to do work that gives me joy. And if that helps others see that there's more to life than a good reputation, that can be a positive step in the right direction. Speaking of the work that you do that brings you joy, your work, your body of work, Alice, is so wide and it's so deep. You're the founder of the Disability Visibility Project. You're a co-partner on, on the political group that's called Crip the Vote. You served on the National Council of Disability. You've edited anthologies of work by disabled writers, uh, and you've done much more. What's the reputation, though, that Alice, that you want to have? If I wrote my own reputation, it would be that I am someone who shows up, is thoughtful, accountable, and collaborative. That I am someone who welcomes critique and change, and that I want to learn and grow from my mistakes and do cool things with cool people. That's a mouthful, but that's how I would like people to perceive me, whether they are acquainted with me or not. Alice, a lot of companies in this country and around the world, but, but not all of them, have a reputation for paying lip service to inclusion and diversity. But, you know, I'm thinking about workers who are disabled, but also black or queer or trans or Asian or indigenous, beyond. But the reputation is that they don't actually then do the real work of reshaping their own cultures after, after talking about it. What are a few examples, if you can name some, of companies and their leaders who like really are in your mind, like really actually doing it right? I think most companies say they want to do the right thing and fell from the top all the way down. It's not enough to have a disability specific employee resource group a day committee, an annual speaker or a consultant or certain metrics. There has to be a long-term commitment that is strategic, systemic, and sustainable. I have felt so incredibly tempted to tell you about my brother, Tommy, who has, you know, just like real magic and humor and love as a person. It, it's really shaped who I am as, as a person. I'm, I'm sure it's shaped me as a journalist. Uh, and, and shape my sister Anna and our, and our parents as well. But I'm going to resist because I feel like so much of the conversation around disabled people is often like very personal and fuzzy and kind of sweet and very, very rarely like about political things or very rarely systemic. Why? Why is that, Alice? People are still averse to complex conversations about ableism because it makes them uncomfortable. We all have internalized or implicit ableism, and it is up to all of us to actually name it and unlearn things that have been designed to marginalize and dehumanize disabled people. For example, people may see me as a somewhat successful published author and editor, but if they took a closer look at my activism and writing, they will see that I openly talk about how because of Medicaid income and asset limits, 
I am unable to have more than $2,000 in my personal bank account. This has been the case since I turned 18, and I bet most of your audience cannot fathom what it's like to subsist on that amount. Later on I do want to hear about your brother Tommy, because I am sure you have some hilarious stories. I am fortunate to have a tight-knit family, and much of the reason it is so tight-knit is because they have all supported me throughout my life, and what we experience as a family in the face of such an absurd, inaccessible, and discriminatory society is something that we just have to laugh with, not cry about. I want to share with our audience that I accommodated your needs by sharing questions for this interview with you a few days ago, and that's so that you could use your text-to-voice technology to answer them. And it reminds me that your muscles have weakened with time. Uh, you haven't always used this technology. And people, I mean, by the way, in including me, I'm about to turn 40, people have very, very strange and complicated feelings about change and about their bodies changing and weakening. What have you learned about how you want to face those changes in ways that, that, feel, that feel right to you? Congratulations on hitting 40 soon. Can you believe this, but I'm turning 50 next year? Change is freaky and scary, but it's unstoppable and out of our control no matter how hard we try. Doctors told my parents that I wouldn't live to adulthood, so I grew up without an image of myself in the future. I couldn't see it, and while I have progressively become weaker and faced changes in my body and life circumstances, it is a freaking privilege and achievement to be this age, and not just surviving but thriving. A few months ago I moved into my old place for the first time. I finally have a home office rather than working from a small desk in my bedroom for decades. I adopted two cats named Bert and Ernie who are my chosen family. I know people pity me and cannot imagine living like me but what I have achieved and lost made me who I am and I don't take anything for granted. Every moment with friends and family is a treasure and I find joy amidst all the struggles and pain. Alice, in the grand scheme of things, I, I really don't think it makes much sense to ask disabled people to help non-disabled people to just like be better. And yet I'm also wondering like if you were just completely like the queen of the world, what you would demand, what, what you would demand from your subjects. Talking specifically about disabled people, in the United States, there is still a bias in Medicaid funding for institutional settings where community-based services are optional for states while institutional settings are not. Many people think skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and nursing homes are safer because a person can get 24-hour care, but no one should be separated from society and hidden from the public. And by the way, Institutions are not necessarily safe. In fact, they are rife with abuse and neglect, especially ones that are for profit owned by private equity companies. I would like to see a world where no one goes hungry and has housing, education, and health care. A world where bodily autonomy is respected. A world where communities and neighborhoods take care of one another. A world where disabled people aren't siloed by diagnosis. A world where we can rest, dream, and create. Those are a few things I hope to see in the future. I want you to know, Alice, how really, how grateful I am. How grateful I am that you've joined us here. Um, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping our paths will cross again one day. I'm, I'm grateful for your time, grateful for your energy, I'm grateful for you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks a bunch for this opportunity, Max. The pleasure is mine. It's the Watch The Business Week Show, Thursday nights, 10.30 Eastern on Bloomberg Television or 8.30 on Bloomberg.com or the Bloomberg app on connected TVs.